Hey everybody, and welcome back to Remton Games. Today, I want to talk about the Super Smash Bros. series. These games are freaking awesome in more ways than one. From the basic fighting mechanics, which are different from pretty much anything else that's not deliberately ripping it off, to the sheer number of stages, items, songs, and different ways to play. However, if there's one thing that defines this series more than anything else, it's the characters. Sure, crossover fighting games are nothing new, but in terms of the sheer amount of different characters and the variety of characters at your disposal, Super Smash Bros. has them all beat. Where else can you have Ryu from Street Fighter duke it out with Jigglypuff from the Pokemon series? Only in my dreams and Super Smash Bros. You want to find out what would happen if Mega Man duked it out with the dog from Animal Crossing? It's a little weird, but they've got you covered. What began as an original idea for a different kind of fighting game that basically added Nintendo characters as a marketing gimmick has since turned into a sort of love letter for the history of gaming. The tiny initial roster of only 12 characters has now expanded to an absolutely enormous roster of over 80 different characters that don't only represent Nintendo, but also companies such as Sega, Microsoft, and Square Enix. And with the announcement of a second Fighter's Pass containing six brand new DLC characters, this absolutely enormous roster is only going to keep growing. I'm pretty sure everyone has a list of characters in their head that they would love to see join the Smash roster, but the point of this video isn't to speculate about future characters in the series. Instead, I want to take a look at what actually is involved in adding a new character to the Super Smash Bros. series such as the latest entry, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. And let me tell you, once I started really looking at what's involved in creating characters for these games, I'm absolutely shocked that this even got made. My hat is off to Masahiro Sakurai and his entire team, and I hope that someday Nintendo eventually lets you rest. Before we can make a new character, we first need to decide what character we're going to make. However, even this seemingly simple step can be extremely difficult, and there's a lot that goes into deciding which characters get to be added to Smash Bros. The first step? Sakurai needs to have a very clear vision for the character. In one of his Famitsu columns, which was faithfully translated by Source Gaming, Sakurai says that it's very important for him to have a clear vision of the character before he begins working on it, because it's this vision that will guide the entire development team in creating the character. Different people might have different ideas of what the character could be, and without a clear vision, the character could end up getting pulled in too many different directions. This step is so important that if Sakurai cannot see a clear vision for the character, or he feels that his vision is impossible to implement, then he will simply drop the character entirely. An example of this is Villager from the Animal Crossing series. Villager was actually originally considered for Brawl, but quickly dismissed because Sakurai didn't see him as the sort of character that would be in combat and couldn't come up with a concept for the character. Later on, when making Smash for the 3DS and Wii U, Sakurai was able to come up with a unique fighting style for Villager and was eventually able to get him added to the game. Another example of the importance of this initial concept is Pac-Man. Pac-Man is one of the oldest characters to be added to the Super Smash Bros. series, and in the 40 years since its original appearance, Pac-Man has appeared in a wide variety of different types of games. He's also had a wide variety of different appearances, both in 2D and 3D. This gives a lot of different potential options for ways that the character could go. However, when developing him for the Smash Bros. series, Sakurai had a very specific idea of Pac-Man in mind. For example, when it comes to the physical appearance of the character, Sakurai liked a more classic look, and was not a big fan of Pac-Man's redesign for the Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures series. He said that if he couldn't use the design that he wanted, that he would probably just drop the character entirely. However, even if Sakurai wants the character and has a clear vision of how to implement it, that doesn't necessarily guarantee the character can get added. The character still has to get approved by Nintendo, and if the character isn't owned by Nintendo, then things can get much more complicated. In some instances, such as with Snake, the creators are enthusiastic about the idea and willing to work with Sakurai to make it happen. In other cases, 
such as with popular fan request Sora from the Kingdom Hearts series, things don't always go as smoothly. Sora has been high on many fans' lists of characters that should join Smash for a long time now, but logistically it seems very difficult. While Nintendo has worked with Square Enix in the past to get Cloud added to Smash, in order to add Sora they would also have to work with Disney and would have to create a version of the character that all three companies could approve of. This seems extremely unlikely to happen, but if anybody could pull it off, it's Masahiro Sakurai. Okay, suppose that Sakurai approves the character and is able to get the go-ahead from Nintendo and any other companies involved. Congratulations! You've now completed step one. Now all you have to do is actually create the character. How hard could that be? As it turns out, pretty dang hard. There's an absurd amount that goes into each and every character, ranging from the extremely noticeable decisions to tiny details that only the most hardcore players are ever going to notice. Let's start with some of the most obvious decisions and go from there. One of the most obvious things about a character are their appearance, so let's start with that. What should your character look like? Well, at first this may seem simple. They should look like the character. But which version of the character? Should they be based on the character's original appearance in their first game, or perhaps their most recent appearance? Or maybe you could make them an amalgamation of all the different versions of the character. Also keep in mind that Smash is a three-dimensional, high-definition game and not all characters have HD appearances to base them off of. Some characters have only appeared in 2D. What do you do then? This was the case for characters like the Ice Climbers and Pit from the Kid Icarus series. His three-dimensional appearance in Kid Icarus Uprising didn't happen until after his appearance in Smash. In these cases, the team has to come up with an original design that's true to the character, but also fits with the rest of the cast of fighters. Once you've decided on your character's basic appearance, you also need to worry about their alternative skins. For some characters, this can be pretty simple, such as Mr. Game & Watch, where each skin is basically a different solid color. For other characters, such as Hero or Bowser Jr., however, each alternative skin represents an entirely different character, and doesn't just require different textures, but entirely original models. Also, Alternative skins aren't just added randomly. Usually each alternative skin represents a part of the character's history. They could represent different costumes that the characters wore in their original games, or represent different characters from those games entirely. A good example of this is Byleth's alternative skins, which all represent either different costumes for the character, or different characters from the original game, such as the three house leaders. Alright, now you've gotten your character approved, and figured out all of their appearances. Now all you have to do is make them move. This is... incredibly daunting, due to the sheer number of different movements that each character can perform in Smash. As far as different possible motions go, some of the options include walking, dashing, jumping, including short hop and full hop, double jumping, ledge grab, including different ways of getting up from the ledge, spot dodging, rolling, and taunting. Each character not only requires unique animations for each of these movements, but there are also a number of parameters that have to be tweaked for each. How fast is your character while they're walking or running? How quickly can they dodge? How high are their different jumps? How fast do they move while they're in the air? How fast do they fall? And so on. All of these parameters have to be adjusted to make the character feel natural to control, to make sure that all the different movements are cohesive and lead into each other, and to be true to the spirit of the original character. A character like Kirby, for example, has really slow ground speed, but good mobility while in the air and a slow falling speed. On the other hand, a character like Little Mac has really quick ground movement and quick attacks, but struggles in the air. Finally, we get to probably the most difficult part of designing a Smash character, designing their attacks. Smash characters all have a massive arsenal of different types of moves they can perform including jabs, tilts, aerials, pummels, get-up attacks, throws, and of course, smash attacks. Each of these attacks is unique and has a nearly infinite number of different parameters that can be tweaked. The first step in determining a character's attacks is figuring out what sort of overall fighter you want them to be. Are they slow brawlers whose attacks do huge amounts of damage and knockback if they can actually land? 
Or are they a quick combo-based character that racks up damage through a series of attacks chained together? Perhaps they're a character that excels in aerial combat, or the sort that likes to keep their distance and use projectiles. Whatever the case, determining their overall fighting style will help guide the development of all of their moves. Once you have a general vision for how the character will fight, you need to begin looking at their individual moves. For some characters, this is easier than others. For Ryu, for example, he already comes from a fighting game series, so many of his attacks could be referenced from attacks already found in Street Fighter. However, even with moves to reference, this still doesn't make your job too easy. Although the character might have some moves that would fit well in Smash, they almost certainly don't have enough moves to fit all of the different types of attacks that a Smash character has, and those that they do have will need to be significantly tweaked. Also, even if the character does have appearances in a previous game that could be used as a reference for their fighting style, this might not fit Sakurai's vision for the character. A good example of this is Mega Man. Before Mega Man got added to Smash, he had already appeared in a series of fighting games, the Marvel vs. Capcom series. It would have been much easier for Sakurai and his team to have simply based his appearance in Smash based on his appearance in Marvel vs. Capcom. After all, that fighting style had already been approved by Capcom and would have been much easier than making an entirely new character from scratch. However, in Marvel vs. Capcom, Mega Man primarily fights using basic punches and kicks, and this didn't fit Sakurai's vision for the character. In the Mega Man games, one of the defining mechanics is the ability to use the abilities of the different robot masters that you defeat, and Sakurai wanted to find a way to implement this in his game. This meant basically ignoring his previous fighting game experience and building the character from the ground up based on his platforming games. Some characters are even tougher to develop than that. Take Captain Falcon, for instance. The F-Zero series is a racing series, not a fighting series. And you don't even directly control Captain Falcon himself. You control his race car, the Blue Falcon. How do you turn the driver of a futuristic race car into a fighting game character? I have no idea, but they did it, and it's freaking iconic. Falcon PUNCH! Not only that, but Smash also contains a peaceful villager from a social sim game, a mannequin-esque workout instructor, and a freaking piranha plant. Somehow, they were able to figure out all of the different movements and attacks that I had previously mentioned for a plant. Keep in mind, building a character's moveset is much more complicated than simply deciding what an attack should do. Even if the attack is just a simple punch, you still need to decide how many frames it takes for the attack to come out, where the hitboxes are placed, how many frames does the hitbox stay out, how many frames of lag are there afterwards, how much damage does the attack do, how much knockback does the attack do, and at what angle. Some attacks can get even more complicated. Some attacks, for example, have special effects such as super armor, invulnerability or invincibility in certain frames or in certain areas, a sweet spot that does more damage, or sour spots that do less damage. And that's before you even start getting into character-specific mechanics, such as Inkling's Ink or Cloud's Limit Gauge. All of these different mechanics have to be finely tuned to keep all of the characters in roughly the same power level and to keep the speed of the game in the right range. With all of these considerations to take into account when designing a character, it's a wonder that a single one ever got made, much less a massive roster of over 80 characters that are all distinguishable yet feel like they fit together. While I certainly have my own list of characters that I would love to see added to these games, no matter who gets added in the second wave of DLC, I won't be mad. Every single character represents so much work, dedication, and care, and I'm just amazed that we get more of this series that has already given us so much. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss more videos like this in the future. If you want to see more, check out my other videos like my last one where I take a look at the life and design philosophy of legendary game designer Sid Meier. I also have over 100 articles on the Remton Games blog, which you can check out at the link in the description down below. And join me next time for part 3 of my ongoing Evolution of Pokemon design series. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.